it's funny to me that the definition of training seems really obvious, but it's not necessarily. So here's what training is. I'm going to give you two definitions of it, two different ways of saying the same thing, really. Training is the consequential change of one organism, one animal's behavior, by the actions of another animal. One animal trying to change the behavior of another animal. Another definition of what training is, and I love this one because it's really um, succinct. Every word matters. It's a very precise definition. Training's controlling consequences to change probability of future behavior. That's it. Think of your very best training session. You know those training sessions you sometimes have where you're in the groove, like the training gods are with you? Everything's going right. You're hoping someone watching or you're wishing you were videotaping yourself because like it doesn't always happen. It's working. Look at this. We're flowing. It feels like flow. It feels effortless when you're really training well. So, salient, anybody tell me where that word comes from? What's the word that that comes from? What does salient mean? In French, it means, salier means to leap. To leap, yay. So, if you remember that, to leap, each of your signals has to be salient. Leaping out from the background. What background? All the information that's available to the animal. If you're giving a visual signal, all the visual noise in the environment. If you're giving an auditory signal, all the literal noise. So here's just, I love this statistic. Human brain receives 400 billion bits of info per second. We process 200 bits. It's one half of one millionth of what's possible. This is shocking. That's all you can handle in terms of input to cognitively process and take in as your reality. This is mind-blowing and more than just animal training. It's just about your life and what you choose, again, to filter in and to filter out. That um, gorilla video, I hope, and gives you an idea of what gigantically obvious things you can filter out if you're not expecting to or if I've misdirected your attention. So you don't sort of process the obvious things. It's not it. You are, have a much more active role in creating your visual cognition and your auditory cognition than you think. And I'm not so concerned about you right now. I'm concerned about if that's true for you. Imagine the poor dogs. Why teach a new cue? This is a quick one. Why would you want a new cue? Maybe you want to switch from your verbal cue to a gesture or vice versa. You just might want to say, I'm going to switch the modality of my cues. To add more green lights to a useful behavior. I mean, how many ways, you know, Years ago, I read, I, this had to be Lana Mitchell online, a pioneer of clicker training, very clever trainer. I read her description. Now, mind you, I've been trained in animals for a long time, and I've got to say, I'm reading online, like when there was click lists I could actually bear to read because people were really nice to each other back when, in the early days. Okay, so I'm reading one of those lists, and she gives us a recipe for teaching a dog that the doorbell means go to your bed. I've got to tell you, I, right now it's like, well, duh, why wouldn't you teach a doorbell to mean go to your bed? Not your doorbell, the doorbell you buy from Home Depot and you leave on your dining room table and you ring the doorbell and say, go to bed, and you practice it when there's no one at the door. Could you get to the point with any dog where they hear the real doorbell and instead of going at the door, they go lie on their bed? Yes, and how brilliant. But I have to say, I read that and went, oh, she's a genius. Now, she is a genius, but it's really just a version of saying, could you be clever in what the cues for your useful behaviors are? Sure, how many ways? A human walks into a room carrying a baby. Not the baby, start off, it's a doll. And the signal for the, that means go to bed? How cool is that if you've got a, someone pregnant in the family? That the dog would say, a, one of the signals for go to my bed is mom or dad's coming in holding a doll. Awesome. It's just a way of saying, let's give another name to a behavior which started off having one cue which might have been pointing to the bed or leaning or park it. You're starting with one maybe not as useful behavior and working up to one that's going to be part of your sequence. It's okay to add lots of names, several names, to the same behavior. Where, as we're talking about putting a behavior on cue, where does it come in the sequence? This is just um, one version of how you train a new behavior from a clicker training perspective. One sequence of your job as a trainer. If you say, I would like to train my dog to uh, bow. You'd first define the behavior precisely. We're not going to go into this in detail. I just want you to see where a couple of these processes are. You'd get the behavior to happen. <laughs> Lots of ways to get the behavior to happen. That's a separate lecture about the 10 different ways you can get a behavior to happen. If you're using a lure, get rid of it now. Getting rid of the lure or prompt or target comes up here. 
I mean, if you're going to do any of the processes we're doing today, this comes early in the process. The Look at that, I'm pointing it, there's nothing coming out of it. Okay. Wow. Oh, there it is. Uh, this is early. Get rid of your prompter lure. Change the picture means move the room you're in, move your orientation of the dog, move how you're standing, make a little bit of changes in the training situation. Shape the behavior, meaning raise your criteria and make it harder. As that, step F, that's the earliest you'd add a cue. That's the very earliest you choose to add a cue is this late in the process. You could rightfully say, I'm really not going to add a cue until I'm going to vary the reinforcement first. You could even drop this down later. Really, the point of this slide is just to say, adding the cue comes much later than your common sense, I think, would say. So you've got to define what you're looking for. You've got to get the behavior to happen. If you're using a lure or a prompt, get rid of it. Do a little bit of changing the training situation so the dog isn't getting stuck in one training context. Make the behavior harder, shape it, raise the criterion, make it even more perfect, faster, shorter latency. Then when it's looking pretty good, not perfect, pretty good. You like the behavior, it's, it's pretty close to what you're eventually going to want. That's when you name it. Name a good version of the behavior, not a bad version of the behavior. Then start mixing it in amongst other cues. And I've moved varying the reinforcement to later. I do less of it early in the process than I used to. I don't put as much emphasis early on in becoming an unpredictable reinforcer like Amanda and I were talking about. I think that comes later. Here's Ken Ramirez's suggestions of folks when he's saying, should you want to do any of the concept cues? I think you can do adduction sooner than you can do a lot of the concept cues. Why? Because this is a combination of two fluent behaviors you're putting together. I think this is an intermediate exercise. The concept cues are an advanced exercise, and what he's going to suggest is this, I think this is a nice warning when I send people out planting seeds of concept cues. Of course, Opie, the brilliant little puppy you saw, breaks all these rules. I mean, and he says, it's just freakish, it, there are exceptions, but in general, if you want to set yourself up to succeed on this, you're going to have a dog that fully understands a clicker or marker signal. You want to be able to use a marker signal in the concept training. Is familiar with criteria changes. Another way to say that is, has been shaped is used to working through a process of gradually successive approximations to a final behavior, has some experience with shaping, is cue savvy, or I would say fast maps, is able to, on a straight behavioral cue, quickly add a cue to it within just a couple of sessions, able to add a cue and understand that. So you've worked through that um, initial flat learning curve or, or gradually upward sloping learning curve of adding a behavioral cue and now that dog understands cues for behaviors pretty well. Ken would say knows four or more action cues or verbs because once you start naming objects, especially if you're doing um, uh, object discrimination, it's nice to be able to have some kind of language where you can say uh, ball, touch, or over, or retrieve. Remember I told you the dolphins had about 12 action cues. He's saying it would be nice if your dog knew four or more actions and he's saying nose target would be one. Uh, paw target, retrieve, or go over. Those are some suggestions. And uh, Ken would say, has been desensitized to a lot of novelty, is used to being in different learning situations, doesn't shut down easily being in novel situations.